it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome Dr. John Lyons. So um, John Ly Dr. Lyons uh, went to undergrad at Union College in New York, um, and he did his PhD at UW-Madison with John Magnuson at the Center for Limnology, who's a, uh, a major pillar in the fisheries field. Um, and then he worked for the DNR for uh, just over 32 years, and he uh, retired last uh, year, and he's now he's got a uh, an appointment at the um, is it the museum? Is that what it's called? The, 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 the University of Wisconsin Zoological Museum. Yeah, and he's uh, he's done some absolutely amazing research on fish for the last uh, <coughs> over 30 years, and I think uh, he might know more about fish in Wisconsin than anyone on the planet. So um, it's my great pleasure to uh, sorry to set you up that way, but um, it's probably true. It's my great pleasure to um, introduce Dr. John Lyons. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. Uh, this is on, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, Wes is accurate in the sense that I am a total fish nerd. <laughs> and I, I love fish. I love all aspects of fish. I'm an equal opportunity fish lover. I like all kinds of fish. And my hope today is that some of that love of fish, some of that interest in fish, will rub off on you. Now, I, I suspect many of you here already like fish. Maybe you like fishing. Maybe you like to eat fish. You keep fish in tanks. And so I'm going to hopefully expand that interest and, and get you some, some maybe little known facts. I call them secrets here, but they're not really secrets. These are, are things that have been published in the scientific literature. But they're the kind of things that most people aren't aware of, and at least from my nerdy perspective, I think are pretty cool. So when you talk about, when you say Wisconsin and you say fish, this is what most people think of. We think of the tremendous sport fish that we have in the state. That's a nice big muskie from Lake Wabisa outside of Madison. And so most people associate fish in Wisconsin with fishing, and understandably so. It's a great state for fishing. About a million people a year in the state, about 15 to 20 percent of the population go fishing. Hundreds of thousands of people come from other states to fish here. It's critically important to the economy of the state, and you could argue it's critically, critically important to the culture of the state. But what I want to do is expand your horizons beyond just the game fish. Now, this is not because I don't like game fish. I love to fish. I love to catch fish. I've never caught a fish like that. I would love to. But um, so I really enjoy game fish. And for 32 years, I worked for the Department of Natural Resources trying to make fishing better. But I'm in, like I said, I'm interested in all kinds of fish, not just the big toothy ones that are good to eat. And so I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the lesser known fishes, or at least some of their lesser known behaviors and, and aspects that maybe will intrigue you to learn more about the fauna of the state. And certainly there's, you know, there's a 20 or so game fish in the state, but there are many more other species that can be both beautiful, like the rainbow darter or the long ear sunfish, or they can be just kind of odd, like the bowfin or the American brook lamprey. And they all have their own charms. They all are, have interesting aspects, and they're all worthy of study and of conservation. So I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of that. And I think a real illustration of this is just the diversity in size and longevity that we have in the Wisconsin fish fauna. So on the top, you have a lake sturgeon, which probably most of you have heard about. Um, it's the biggest fish in the state. It's also the longest lived fish in the state. So it can exceed 200 pounds in weight. It can live for more than 100 years, more than most people. The fish at the bottom you probably not heard about. It's called the least darter. It's the smallest fish in the state. It's 0 .002 pounds maximum weight. So it's 1 100,000th the size of a big sturgeon. And that's as an adult. That's its maximum size. And it lives maybe one to two years. So it lives 1 100th of the duration of a lake sturgeon. So there's this tremendous diversity out there, this tremendous uh, variety and variability. So let's start off by asking, how big is the Wisconsin fish fauna? We've talked about there's 20 or so game fish, but what is the total Wisconsin fish fauna? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Just yell it out. 160. 160. Any other? 176. Any other guesses? 500. 500. <laughs> well, you guys are actually really good, and maybe you've, we have some people who have actually learned this number, or or at least are a little bit more aware because the, the, we'll talk about the true number here is actually a little bit of a moving target, but about 140 native species and then you add about 17 established non-native things that were either stocked here or invaded here. 
And so you're up around 157. And the reason this number is inexact and isn't a, a very specific number is because we're still trying to figure out in some cases whether certain things really are species or not. And so even though this, the fauna of the state has been well studied for well over 100 years, there are still some things we're not sure, is that really a species or that is not? And I'll give you an example of that later on in the talk. Now the interesting thing, I'm, I'm impressed with this crowd, so even the 500 number, you're in the ballpark. <laughs> you know, I, I give this kind of talk a lot of places, and um, not this specific one, but you know, on, and I asked this number, and, and even if I give it like at UW-Madison to like a, a fish ecology class, I'll get people say six. <laughs> or I'll get people say 200,000, you know, and so the, the numbers are all over the map. But these are, these are the numbers, so roughly 150. So let's put that into context. Is that a lot? Is that a little? Um, do we have a really rich fauna? Do we have a really poor fauna? Let's put it in context. Well, there's a couple ways to do that. We can look at it in global terms. We can say, how does the Wisconsin fish fauna compare against all the other fish in the world? Well, there's estimated to be about 40,000 different fish species in the world. Um, only at this point, only maybe 32,000 have actually been formally described, but at the rate people have made these estimates based on the rate at which new species are being discovered. And there still are many new species being discovered in the deep ocean and in the jungles of Amazon, and, and new species are being described all the time. But the estimate is that there's about 40,000. So if there's 140 native species in Wisconsin, that's about a third of a percent of the world's fish fauna. So we actually have a tiny fraction of the world's diversity that's out there. So in that context, you say, well, yeah, Wisconsin doesn't really have much. There's so many other you know, fish species out there all over the world. But now let's, again, put that in perspective. So. What would, you, what, what would we expect to find in Wisconsin if fish species were just randomly distributed across the surface of the earth, including the oceans? So if you took all the fish species in the world and just randomly threw them around the world, how many fish species would you expect to find in Wisconsin? And we can do that based on the area of the earth. And so the earth is 197 million miles, square miles in area. And Wisconsin is 65,500 square miles in area, so it's actually three one-hundredths of a percent of the world's surface area. So even though we have a, a third of a percent of the fish fauna, we only have a three one-hundredths of a percent of the world's surface area. So we have about 12 times more fish species than you'd expect if everything was just thrown out there randomly. And another way of looking at that is if it was random, we'd have 12 fish species. So that guess of six, I guess, maybe wasn't that far off. <laughs> Um, so that's one way of looking at it. So we actually have a much richer than expected fish fauna. We have more fish species here than you would expect, just based on sort of random distribution of species on the surface of the earth. And that undoubtedly relates to the great diversity and, and quality of the aquatic habitats we have, the, the Great Lakes, the Mississippi River, all the myriad of inland lakes and the, and the many, many miles of stream and river habitat. So we have a very rich fish fauna relative to the earth, the area of the earth that we occupy. Now let's compare ourselves with other parts of the world and just see how we rate. So if we look at just the temperate zone, so the area at about 45 degrees north latitude, and the same would be true if we looked at south latitude as well. So in terms of a temperate fish fauna, again, we're very rich. So this is a comparison among some different parts of the world and I've standardized these by area. So the area of Wisconsin, 65,000 square miles. So I've taken areas of these other places about 65,000 square miles. So it's an apples to apples comparison. And so we have on the order of three times as many species as you, native species as you'd find in Oregon. There, we have many more species than we do there. About two and a half times more than you'd find in a uh, comparable area of South Korea. The same as you'd find in the area of Iraq. I just want to try to go around the world at the same latitude. And again, about four times as many as you'd find in a comparable area of Central Europe, Switzerland. So in a temperate system, we have a very rich fauna. And again, something to be excited, something to celebrate. We have a lot more fish species than you might expect, given where we sit in the world and where we, uh, and, and the, just the area of the state. So that's east to west. Let's look north to south now. 
And here the difference is a little, uh, Wisconsin doesn't rate quite so well. Um, and there's a general tendency well known that if you go from the poles to the equator, there's a general tendency for more species. And that more or less holds for fish. So if we're up in Alaska or northern Ontario, we have many more fish species than they do. However, as we go south, Tennessee has twice as many fish species as we do. And in fact, Tennessee is the most diverse temperate area in the world. So in terms of temperate faunas, now we're not talking about tropical, but temperate faunas, Tennessee is, is ground zero for biodiversity. And so they have on the order of closer to 300 native species in a, in a similar sized area. And northern Alabama, parts of Mississippi all fit into that. However, if you go down to some tropical areas like Mexico and Costa Rica, uh, Wisconsin actually does better. And so even compared to some tropical areas, we have a pretty rich fauna. But then you get down in the heart of the equatorial area, say the Amazon basin in Peru, they have about three times as many fish species. And the same would be the case if you were in the Congo River in Zaire, the Mekong River in, in Thailand, in the African Rift Lakes, those great tropical hot spots of diversity. The same would be true if you were in a, the Great Barrier Reef, if you wanted to make a comparison with marine areas. So we're pretty good, we're very good in fact, in terms of temperate fauna, but not so good in terms of the, the, the real true hot spots of the world, which are in the tropics. Well, now I'm gonna talk about my four, four secrets, and secrets I put in quote here because they're not secret. They're published in the literature. They're, they're well established and well documented. This isn't some thing I came up with on my own. In fact, I had nothing to do with any of the research I'm gonna talk about. Um, but they're interesting aspects, things that even though they're in the literature, even though they're out there to be found, I think most people are unaware of. And some of these things, at least to me, are kind of amazing and, and, and pretty cool. And so I just wanna give you a flavor. I, again, there's 150 species out there. I can't cover them all. I just cherry picked a few examples of things that I find particularly interesting or unusual or une unexpected that are maybe worth talking about and maybe a win you bet in a bar or something like that. <laughs> so first of all, there's this concept that there are fish that can actually drown if they're kept from the air and fish that will drown in water. And I'm not talking about a winter kill situation where they're trapped under the ice and all the oxygen you know, disappears from the water which, you know, and then they suffocate. I'm talking about a situation where a fish out in open water under summer conditions can drown if it's kept underwater. And the fish I'm referring to are one of my all-time favorite groups, the gars. And this is an ancient predatory fish. Look at that, that beak there with all those teeth. They're adapted to catching other fish and that's about a four and a half foot long fish. That's my son about 10 years ago. And I, I will say he did not follow in his father's footsteps. He was wise, he went into business. <laughs> but, and he's not really a big outdoor guy, but he thought this was the coolest thing. When I, you know, I dragged him there against his will. You gotta help me, because I'm short-handed. And, oh, why, Dad? <laughs> and then, then he thought that was so cool when we caught that big gar in our nets. But these are fish that can actually drown, and I'll talk about why and, and how that happens. So gar in ancient lineage, this is a fossil from almost 150 million years ago that's on display in the Field Museum in Chicago. And so they arose during the Jurassic period, you know, Jurassic Park, all that. And they were common, in fact, they were one of the dominant parts of the freshwater fishery for, for millions of years, found all over the world. And then gradually, through evolution, other forms arose and displaced a lot of these gars, so now they're left only as relic populations. The only place in the world you find gar now are in North America and, and, and actually on the island of Cuba. And there's only seven species total in the world where probably 100 million years ago there were several hundred species. And two of those occur in Wisconsin. The long-nosed gar, aptly named because it has that long, thin beak, full of teeth, and the short-nosed gar, which has that shorter beak, also full of teeth. And so those two species are in Wisconsin, so it's really cool. You can go out and see a fish that hasn't changed much from its ancestors that existed when the dinosaurs roamed. And if we think about, you know, if you ever have this vision, what, was, what were aquatic habitats like in the Jurassic period, in the Cretaceous period? I think our first version is a big swamp. There's all these, you know, trees and this kind of stagnant, really warm water. It was a much warmer climate then. 
Um, you know, there's maybe proto alligators, dinosaurs in the water. And so this was a water that typically would not have a lot of oxygen, at least during certain times of the year. So most fish are breathing dissolved oxygen in the water through their gills. And over time, biological processes can take the oxygen out of the water, making a lot less oxygen, and the fish then have to deal with reduced dissolved oxygen. And even today, we find that gar, most of the time, their habitats are in backwaters or sloughs or side channels. Again, areas that at certain times of the year get really low in oxygen. And so gar, over these millions of years, adapted ways to breathe air directly. So when the water, when the oxygen got low in the water, they would breathe air. They would come up to the surface. They would break the surface, open their mouth, grab a gulp of, of air, bring it in. It would actually go into their swim bladder, which they used to regulate their buoyancy. And that swim bladder had become modified over time to be covered with capillaries that could take oxygen out of the air. And they could breathe, literally breathe air. So they had essentially a functional lung in their swim bladder, and then they still do. And so gar are able then to exploit habitats that have very low dissolved oxygen because they can breathe air. If the oxygen in the water is too low, they come up and breathe air and they do just fine. The issue is that the amount they, over time, because they're so good at breathing air, their gills have atrophied a bit. They still have gills and they still use those gills, but they're not nearly as well developed as they are in most other fish because they have this capability. And remember that fish are cold-blooded and so their metabolism is a function of the temperature. And when the water temperature is low, their metabolism is low. They're not as active, they're not burning as much energy, they don't need as much oxygen. But the more the water temperature goes up, the higher their metabolism gets and the more oxygen they need in order to, to function. At the same time, it's a fact that the warmer the water is, all other things being equal, the less oxygen it holds. So it's kind of a double whammy. They need more oxygen, the water has less oxygen as the temperature gets warm. So the details of this graph aren't particularly important, but basically it says when the water temperature is 50 degrees, gar do very little air breathing. They you know, might come to the surface to get air once every couple of hours or so, and it represents less than 5% of their actual oxygen need. So they could do without it, and in fact they often do. And when it gets down around freezing, they absolutely don't breathe air, they just rely on their gills. But when you get up around 68 degrees, all of a sudden they're getting about 40% of their air, of their oxygen from the air, as opposed to from the water. And they're breathing, they're taking these breaths about once every 10 minutes or so, they're coming up to the surface. And then you get in the middle of summer when the water temperatures are in the 80s, and they're getting over 60% of their oxygen from the air, more than half. And they're coming to the surface every couple of minutes to breathe. And basically, once the water temperature hits about 75, 80, they have to come to the surface and breathe or they won't have enough. They can tough it out for a while using their gills, but they will eventually suffocate. And so the question is then, oh, all right, that's a, sort of a theoretical possibility, but why would they drown then? Why would they, you know, there's always the surface of the water. They can always come up to the surface of the water. Why, how on earth would they drown in this case? They just come up and take a breath. Well, the reason is me, because I set these nets in the water and the fish get stuck and they can't come to the surface and they basically suffocate. They basically drowned in about an hour or two. And it, it, every time this happens, it breaks my heart because I love gar and to kill them unnecessarily this way um, really hurts me. Not to mention they are the grossest fish I've ever dealt with when they're dead. They just ooze slime and they stink and, but so, Gar drowning is a completely artificial phenomenon, but it can happen. Basically, when we people put our nets in the water, do fishery surveys like I do, catch the gar and keep them from getting to the surface. But like I said, this is, you know, this, this pains me to no end to kill these gar. And I'll just point out, this is the so-called alligator gar, which is, pro we don't have them in Wisconsin. They historically occurred up all the way up to Southern Illinois but not this far north. And they are one of the coolest fish on earth. They get it to a length of over 10 feet and can weigh over 300 pounds and they have literally a mouth the size of an alligator's mouth. And so gar are just wonderful creatures. All right, now we're gonna talk about cloning and we're gonna talk about real cloning, natural cloning, not something in a lab. 
and the fact that there are clonal fish in Wisconsin, fish that are produced clonally. And we'll talk about how that came about and really what I think the amazing sort of history of this that, that still kind of boggles my mind. So lots of the, the clones that we're dealing with in Wisconsin are hybrids. Now when we talk about mammals or birds, hybrid two different species mating is a pretty uncommon phenomenon. So you th think of a thing like a mule, which is a hybrid between a donkey and a horse, and it's artificially produced. Humans kind of force it to happen. So natural hybrids of, of, of mammals and birds are pretty scarce, but in fish they're actually really common. Fish hybridize all the time, and in fact there's at least 52 different hybrid combinations of one species as the male and another species as the female. And this is just an example of four different ones that involve uh, the aptly named common shiner, which is a common stream and lake species. And it hybridizes with basically any species it occurs with. And um, all of these are normal hybrids where there was a mom from one side and a dad from the other, and they produce an offspring that has half their genetic material from one species and half from the other, genetic other species, except for one. And this is the clonal one. Now this is a nondescript species that's actually, or nondescript entity, that's actually in northern Wisconsin, fairly common, and it's the hybrid between the fine scale dace and the northern red belly dace, which are two small minnow species that are common in northern Wisconsin. They like to live in these low gradient, kind of boggy, marshy habitats. They're really common in beaver pond habitats like that. That's a great habitat for them. And You'll see, you know, true fine scale dace, you'll see true northern red belly dace, and then it's very common to find these hybrid in individuals which are essentially intermediate in their, cat in, their, in their attributes. And so you can tell them apart. You know, they have internal characteristics that are intermediate as well as external characteristics. And these hybrids have been known for a long time and no one thought much about them until they started looking at them. And they found several weird things about them. First of all, these hybrids are distributed all over northern North America, northern U.S., up into Canada. But they found that you were finding these hybrids in places where there had never, ever been a report of a fine scale dace. There were reports and there were, you know, lots of examples of northern red belly days, but there were no fine scale days. So the question was, well, how do you have this hybrid if one of the parent species isn't present? How does that work? So, Places like Montana, places like Nebraska, they have northern red belly days, they have the hybrid, but they have no fine scale days. So how does that work? And then people started dissecting these things and looking at the hybrids, and 100% of them are female. There is no such thing as a hybrid male fine scale times northern red belly days. They're all females, 100%, no exceptions. And then as genetic techniques got better and people started to look at these, they turned out that all the hybrids you'd find in a pond or an area were genetically identical. They were clones of each other. And you'd find a big adult and a brand new, newly hatched young fish, they would be identical. They were clones. Now this seems pretty bizarre that they would reproduce asexually in, in a vertebrate. It turns out it's not unheard of and, and the, the northern red belly fine scale dace hybrid was not the first of these to be detected. It was actually a, a type of molly in Mexico in the 1930s. But over the years, people have documented about 100 or so of these clonal hybrids that reproduce clonally out of, again, about 80,000 different vertebrates species. Most of the examples are fishes. There's a few um, salamanders that, that hybridize this way and then a handful of lizards. So you don't see it in mammals and birds, but you see it in the lower vertebrates, particularly in the fishes. But again, it's still kind of a rare phenomenon. So what's going on? Well, let's first talk about normal reproduction just to set the stage. So if you had two northern red belly dace, a male and a female, that were going to reproduce, well, each of those fish, the male, has two sets of chromosomes, the so-called diploid set of chromosomes duplication of all its genetic material in those chromosomes. And during the period of meiosis, when the male is forming sperm, there's a process where it creates sperm and you get one copy of the chromosome, the so-called haploid number. And this is, this is biology 101, okay? And so, same with the female. They have two sets of chromosomes, a diploid number. Through meiosis, they produce 
haploid eggs. Okay, so they have half of their genetic material in the egg, the male has half of its genetic material in the sperm. And then those eggs are fertilized, the fertilized egg gets half of its genetic material from the male, half of it from the female. Okay, just like in humans, just like in, in any mammal or bird. And then you get northern red-bellied ace offspring that are both male and female. You can get both types, and that's normal reproduction. Okay. Well, this clonal reproduction is different. So, first of all, the clonal females, the hybrid females, cannot reproduce by themselves. So a female can't reproduce, you know, can't mate with a female, but they can't just decide, oh, I'm going to have some eggs and produce them, or, or fertile eggs. And so they can't reproduce by themselves. They must have the male northern red-bellied dace present and the male northern belly, red belly days to actually mate with them in order to trigger successful reproduction. And so again, the male red belly days has this diploid number of chromosomes that when they form sperm, they have this haploid single N, half their sperm, half their DNA is in the sperm. The female hybrid has the same diploid number of chromosomes, but it doesn't divide them in half. It creates an egg that has all of its chromosomes in it. So it doesn't go through the same process. It goes through a process of parthenogenesis, cloning essentially, where it duplicates itself in the egg. And how exactly this happens and what triggers it is, is a good question, but it happens. And so then they have these eggs, and what happens is the male sperm, in most cases, it hits the egg, it triggers development, but the genetic material in the egg never actually gets taken up. And so most of the time, that those chromosomes from the male are lost. So the male is reproduced here, but it's, he's wasted all his effort because none of his genes are gonna go forward. Now there are a few cases where the, the material does come into the egg, but it comes in as sort of extra DNA. It doesn't replace anything from the female. So now it has what's called a triploid. It has three, ti or three times as much DNA in it, or one and a half times more than it would normally have. And so this is a little unusual for these clonal. Usually clonal, it's just strictly you go to, the, uh, you go to here and the male participates but doesn't get any benefit. But in some individuals, the male does get a benefit and its genes are passed along. And it, in the same population, you can have fish that have both, where some of them have the male and some don't. So it's kind of an interesting system, somewhat unique for these guys. But either way, you end up with a female hybrid. Again, no males are produced. You have a female hybrid, and it either has just the DNA from the original hybrid or all of the DNA from the hybrid plus some from the male. All right, so that's kind of weird. And so then the question is, well, how common is this hybridization? How often does it occur? Is it something that we're seeing regularly, and you know, every time you put a male Northern red belly dice with a female fine scale dace, are they hybridizing? Is that sort of a common occurrence or is it something that happens just once in a while? And so people started to look into this. Because they're clonal, it's hard to figure out how far back the original reproduction, you know, re hybridization event occurred directly because every fish is a copy of itself. Um, and so there was a, what I thought a really interesting paper done a few years ago where they decided to look at whole bunch of different hybrid populations around the range of the species. So you can see you find them in the east, you find them in Quebec, you find them in Connecticut, you find them in Nebraska, uh, Montana, you find them in Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota, all over the place, up in Alberta. And the idea was if hybridization was happening all the time, first of all you'd go into a population and you would find different clonal lineages. You know, this particular clone was was male A ver and female A spawning together. This particular clonal lineage was male C and female C forming together. So you'd expect to see different clonal lineages. They would still be clones of each other. They'd be identical copies, but they would be different from each other. Didn't find that. Every time they went to a particular spot, all the clones, every single fish they found was the same. So it was as if there was only one spawning event in that particular system. But it got even weirder than that, that when you looked over the course of the range of the species, every single clone in North America is the same. So if you went and looked at a hybrid out in Montana, 
it would have essentially the same genetic makeup as a hybrid here in Wisconsin, as a hybrid in Quebec. And people thought about, well, how could that happen? And the other thing is that some of the places they looked at were certainly covered with glaciers within a certain time frame. Other places were never covered with glaciers. And so we know that those fish had to have been produced in the same place, and they had to have been produced before the glaciers receded. And so they estimate that it happened because of a single hybridization. All the hybrids that we have out there, everywhere in North America, from one hybridization event that occurred approximately 50,000 years ago, one time. And that they have about a two-year generation time, so that was 25,000 generations ago. And ever since then, they've been reproducing clonally. They need the male, but the male doesn't really contribute directly. And so this is why we're, we're debating how many species there are, because by some definitions, this clone is actually its own species. It needs the male to reproduce, but it doesn't take any of the male's genetic material. And so you could argue that actually we have 141 species, because this, this is a species. But other definitions, it wouldn't count. So this is why I, the number is a little fuzzy. All right, let's talk about electricity in fish. Well, certainly the strangest and, and arguably the coolest looking fish in Wisconsin is the paddlefish. This is another ancient lineage. It's contemporary origins with the gars, so 100 to 150 million years ago. But it is certainly a strange looking fish, particularly that, that long canoe paddle-like snout that it has. And you know, it's, it's crazy looking. It's two, three feet long and a big fish. It looks just like a canoe paddle. And so from the time these fish were first discovered and, and talked about by scientists, there's always been speculation of what is that paddle for? What do we use it for? Why, why does this fish have this paddle? Because we don't see it on any other fish to, to this extent. And if you were to go along, even today, you go along the Mississippi River and talk to some of the river rats who, who are familiar with this species, and they're going to tell you without question that it's a weapon, that they see them fighting with them, or, or that they see them digging up in the bottom to get food. Um, not the case. There's some argument you could say, well, it's kind of a stabilizer. When they open their big mouth, this keeps them swimming level. But again, they've done some hydrodynamic analyses. That doesn't really pan out. So one thing, though, when the early explorers first discovered the paddlefish, they actually classified and thought it was a type of freshwater shark. And you can kind of imagine that when you look at the back end of a paddlefish. It's got this gray, leathery skin. It has this asymmetrical tail, what's called a heterocircle tail, where the, where the top lobe is a little bit longer than the bottom lobe. And it's just like that of a shark. And so early explorers said, well, this might be some kind of a shark. Now, when you look at the mouth of these two things, they're pretty different. So a shark, of course, has this snout full of big teeth. And the paddlefish has this big snout. It has a big mouth but there are no teeth whatsoever in the jaw. Instead, it has all these fine filaments on its gills called gill rakers, which are used for sieving things out of the water. And so where the shark is going to eat small fish, the, the paddlefish is actually eating tiny, and this is highly magnified, tiny microscopic, what are called zooplankton, little aquatic invertebrates that are less than a millimeter long, drifting in the water column. And they're tiny, they're, you know, most of them, Many of them can't be seen with the naked eye. And so the, you know, the, the shark is adapted with those teeth to crunching on fish. The paddlefish is adapted with that mouthful of this sort of sieve-like filter of sieving out all these tiny, tiny organisms out of the water. And that's what it feeds on. So paddlefish won't bite you. They won't attack you. They have no teeth even if they did. They just swim around with that big mouth open, gathering zooplankton to eat in their habitat. The other thing they share with sharks are these receptor organs. In the shark, they're on the, the snout, which of course isn't nearly as long, but they're also on the paddlefish. And these are called ampullae of Lorenzini. And essentially, they are electroreceptacle organs. So they can receive and detect electric currents in the water. And it's long been known that sharks use these to detect other fish under dark or, or turbid conditions. Because any living organisms, when it's swimming, it produces a weak electric field, and very weak. You need a very sensitive instrument 
to detect it. But in fact, these organs are capable of detecting very weak electric fields. And what's been shown with experiments with paddlefish is their snouts are just covered with these ampullae and that they're extremely sensitive. And so they've done measurements that a one millimeter long zooplankton, a little daphnia, swimming along in the water, produces an electrical current of about one millivolt. And a paddlefish, turns out, can detect one millivolt, about a foot or two from their paddle. So you can think of this paddle as they have their own giant built-in voltmeter. And they're swimming around. They live in very turbid, cloudy water where it's really hard to see. And so there's going to be many instances where they're never going to be able to see these critters. And this allows them then to detect zooplankton in the water, particularly concentrations, because they're putting off this tiny electrical field. And the paddlefish uses that snout to home in on the electrical field and can actually <coughs> feed then in very, very dirty water where they would never be able to see these things. And they're extremely good at it. The flip side of that is they're really sensitive to metal because just a piece of metal in the water, a piece of iron or something like that, puts off its own electrical field. And that freaks paddlefish out because they're detecting this, this field around this iron and they don't know what it is. The other thing I'll throw, the other interesting um, similarity with sharks, even though they're not even remotely closely related to each other, is that of all the sharks, you know, we think of them as these top predators and these big teeth and eating, you know, eating seals and big fish and things like that. But the two biggest sharks in the world, the, the whale shark and the basking shark, which are also the two biggest fish in the world, are plankton eaters, just like the paddlefish. They don't have big teeth in their jaws. They don't specialize on other fish. They eat krill and, and other plankton out in the ocean. So even though they're completely unrelated, they're, they diverged 300 million years ago, the paddlefish and the shark share all these similarities, particularly this electroreceptive sense. And my last little vignette here um, will talk about the lengths that some species will go to be able to mate successfully. And in this case, we'll talk about a relatively well-known actual game fish species. I'll, I'll violate my own rule and talk about game fish and not just non-game. And that's the bluegill. We're going to talk about the sex life of the bluegill. So pretty exciting, right? And um, the bluegill is certainly one of the most common fish in the state. It's definitely the most common fish that anglers catch and, and eat and harvest. They're, they're wonderful sport fish. They're very accommodating for, for new and inexperienced anglers. If any of you have done much fishing, this was probably the first type of fish you ever caught off the dock at the lake. And, and, um, and they're wonderful fish. They, they can be very easy to catch and they're wonderful to eat. They can also be very challenging to catch. So bluegill are one of these fish that are one of the conspicuous denizens of Wisconsin's aquatic habitats. And because they're so obvious, because they're so common, they live in shallow water, they're easily viewed, we really thought we had it all figured out in terms of their reproductive behavior. I mean, 120, 130 years ago, scientists were describing the basic aspects of bluegill re reproduction. And everyone thought, you know, things were settled then back around 1900 that, you know, we didn't really need to look at these guys anymore because they're, they're pretty well understood. And basically what, and this is true, this happens, but what was described was essentially that you have male bluegills, bigger bluegills, they get kind of a yellow or an orange belly, and they stake out and make little nests in the shallows. They excavate a little sort of oval depression. And then they defend that area, that territory. They try to lure a female in to spawn with them. And if they're successful and get spawning, then they guard the fertilized eggs very pugnaciously. And then when the eggs hatch, they guard the fry and basically shepherd them up till they're old enough to fend and large enough to fend for themselves. And they tend to spawn in colonies, in groups. So if you rarely see a bluegill nest by itself. They tend to be grouped around each other. And there's a variety of reasons for this. But, but they're a colonial nesting species. And this is, you know, you go out in any clear water lake in you know, late May and June, and you can find these, these nests. You can see bluegills on them, the males guarding the nest. And anglers figured this out a long time ago. They call the spawning areas the beds, the spawning beds. And because the males are pugnaciously guarding these areas, anything you throw in there, they'll strike. And so it's really easy to catch them. And 
you can almost cherry pick your fish. You say, well, there's the biggest one. I'll cast to that one. You drop it in his nest area. He's going to grab the bait. And so it's very easy, very successful way of fishing to the point that a lot of people consider it unsporting and won't do it just because the fish are so vulnerable and it's so easy to catch a lot of the biggest bluegill in the lake this way. And so this, this actually, you know, this, this is part of the bluegill spawning um, repertoire. But it turns out that it's a lot more complicated than that. And about 25 years ago, simultaneously, coincidentally, two graduate students decided to look in more detail at bluegill spawning behavior. And what they came up with really, I think, is, is pretty interesting. So we'll start with the question of, OK, so in order to be a successful nesting male, you have to be big and strong and pugnacious. You've got to be one of the biggest fish in the area. You've got to be able to hold that territory from other males and keep other marauding fish out of it. And so those what we call parental males, those nesting males, are, are the biggest and the baddest in the lake. And so what do you do in a lake where there isn't much spawning habitat available, but there's lots of bluegills? Well, in that case, maybe only 10% of the males are going to be these big spawners. And so other males, you know, they're kind of out of luck. You know, how are they, you know, they have to hope that they're going to grow big and strong enough in order to spawn successfully. Otherwise, they will never reproduce, never pass their genes on to future generations. And so if you can't be that, it turns out a couple of alternative strategies have evolved over time, and they're pretty interesting. First of all, there's what's called the sneaker male. And this is basically a male that when it's still at the size and age where it normally be a juvenile, it begins to mature. And so it develops a testes, but it doesn't develop any of the external characteristics that would mark it as a male. It looks just like a little juvenile. And so the only way you could tell whether it truly is a juvenile and whether it truly is a male is to dissect the fish and look at the condition of the gonads. And so it has a maximum size of maybe three inches. It's this big, where a normal bluegill male you know, might be like this and weigh maybe 100 times more. It's only a year or two old. And it's called a sneaker because what it basically does is it swims around the edge of the colony acting like it's a juvenile bluegill which the males basically ignore because, well, a juvenile, he's not going to you know, steal a, a female from me, so I'm not worried about him. And then when it sees a male and a female actively engaged in spawning, it tries to sneak between them really quickly, release some milk, release some sperm, fertilize a few eggs. It definitely won't fertilize all of them, and then gets out of there as fast as it can. So it sneaks in there and tries to sneak fertilizations. The issue is the males aren't stupid, and they quickly recognize, no, this isn't really a juvenile, and they try to do a number on them. So it's a really risky strategy. You get in there, you don't have to go to all the trouble of nesting, but, but you have to run the gauntlet of all these males who are going to be pretty pissed <coughs> off. Now there's an intermediate strategy that's called a satellite. And so these are males that get a little bit bigger, a little bit older, and instead of mimicking a juvenile, they mimic a female. And so again, they look just like a female. And you can kind of tell females they have a little bit characteristic shape and, and color pattern. And they look like a female. And again, the only way to be certain which is which would be to go dissect the fish. And they're a little bit bigger. They're a little bit older. And they basically, instead of trying to sneak in, they try to use their disguise and come in as if they're a female. And so they wait until the, you know, the, the male is with a true female. And then they come in hoping that the male will think, well, there's another female. As soon as I'm done here, I'll have a, another female. And same deal. Just as those two are spawning, this one comes up, releases some sperm, fertilizes a few eggs, and then gets out of there. Again, the male's not going to be happy when he figures this out. But they're a little bit bigger, a little bit better able to defend themselves. So you end up with three different types of males in a bluegill colony. And they have trade-offs. So if you're a big male, if you're successful, and have, you're going to fertilize by far the most eggs and have the most offspring. But you might die before you get that big and old to spawn, so you might not get anything. Nesting is really costly. They, they're not feeding during this time. They're fighting all the time. So there's injuries. There's disease. There's lots of things. You might, and there's no guarantee that you're going to even be successful. You might not attract a female or not. 
At the other extreme, you have the sneaker. Well, this guy spawns early, doesn't have to live very long to mature, has no nesting costs. It just swims in and swims out, lets the male defend its eggs and its young up to the point where they were leave. So the male is taking care of its kids. But the cons are, A, it's small. It doesn't have much sperm. It doesn't fertilize many eggs. So if there's 500 eggs in the nest, you know, they might get 25 of them. And it's really risky. They're small fish to begin with, so they're vulnerable to all sorts of other pressures. And now they're going to be vulnerable to these very angry males that detect them. And then sort of in between are these satellites. They spawn a little bit later, a little bit bigger. So they're kind of in between. They fertilize a few more eggs, but they in turn then, um, and they don't have quite the risk, but, but they have some of the downsides of, of not being actually defending the nest and having to cope with an angry male. So you have all three types, and then the question is, well, what determines how many of each you have? Well, the first thing is you've got to always have more parentals than anything else, because the sneaker and the satellite, they can't do anything. They can't spawn. They, they don't have a nest. They aren't guarding anything. They rely on these parentals to guard their eggs, to guard their young. And so there's always going to be more parental males out there. And some of this is genetically determined. If you're a parental male, you have a better chance of becoming another parental male than you do a sneaker or a satellite. But it's not completely genetically fixed. And so there's an environmental factor, and it probably relates to the density of fish that are out there, the growth rates, the mortality rates, what kind of habitat is available. And I think this in particular is a really interesting avenue of future research if you compare different bluegill populations. And why does you know, one population have very few sneakers and satellites and the other one have a whole host of them? And, and why does that happen and how is that maintained over time? All right, so that's my quick overview of some interesting, a major friend, gee whiz kind of facts about the Wisconsin fish fauna. So five take home points. Wisconsin has a very rich fish fauna, particularly for the temperate zone, much richer than you might expect, but it pales in comparison to some of the tropical diversity hotspots. Gar, one of my favorite fish, can drown if I'm out on the water. Um, they need to breathe air, and so they're an air breathing fish when the water is warm. When the water is cool, they're a water breathing fish, but when the water is warm, they breathe air, or at least predominantly air. And so if they're kept from the surface, they will drown, just like a human kept from the surface will drown. They won't be able to get it air. True clones of these dace occur in, in northern Wisconsin, and you might consider them their own species, but they all, everywhere in North America, they resulted from one freaky hybridization event, you know, maybe 50,000 years ago, and they've continued and spread from there and thrived after that single event way back when. The paddle of the paddlefish is basically a voltmeter, which is, is pretty cool to think about. They're able to detect very, very minute electrical fields, and they use that then in their feeding. And finally, bluegills have this sort of kinky three-way male sort of thing going on. Um, and you know, some are imitating juveniles, some are imitating females. And so when you're out, if you're out fishing on these bluegill beds and you can see the big males guarding their, um, guarding their nest, take a look on the edges and you might see some little, little guys and you say, well, those are just juveniles. No, maybe not. And then maybe you see what you think are females, but maybe they're not. So it's actually quite a complicated um, panorama of things going on. And so with that, I'm open to any questions. Oh. Can you talk about mad toms a little bit? Just, I sure. Mean, it's a group that okay. don't even realize that these do. Well, uh, the mad tom is a type of catfish. Um, and so Wisconsin has eight different species. Am I, is that right? Yeah, eight different species of catfish. And the, the big ones people might know about are channel catfish and flathead catfish because they get quite large. They're important game fish species. And then maybe you've caught bullheads in a pond. They're sort of medium size. Again, pretty good eating. You could consider them a sport fish. But then there are three species of mad toms. And these are miniature catfish. A stone cat can get maybe this long, but most of them are about this long. They live on the bottom. They're kind of inconspicuous. They're nocturnal. Um, three species. One, the stone cat likes kind of fast moving water. Another, the tadpole mad tom, which looks like a tadpole, um, likes kind of slower, weedier water. And then there's a particularly rare form only found in southeastern Wisconsin 
called the slender mad tom, which is actually a state endangered species. It also liked rocky areas. And um, they're a little bottom dwelling fish, pretty inconspicuous. Unless you go out and actually try to sample them, you won't find them. Um, what's interesting about them is they have, um, like all catfish, they have pectoral and dorsal spines. And in mad toms, these are poisonous. And not deadly poisonous, but if you've ever been stabbed by a, a tadpole mad tom spine, you will not forget it and you will not do it again. It's like a really, really bad bee sting and it lingers for hours and you're, you know, wherever it gets stabbed gets numb. And I suppose if someone had some sort of allergic reaction, it would actually be um, potentially fatal. Interesting thing is despite those spines, which are clearly some sort of anti-predator mechanism, um, and, and tadpole mad toms have the worst venom by far, they are also one of the best baits for walleye you can come up with. And they, they're sold along the Mississippi River as willow cats and they sell for like a dollar or two a piece. And um, even though they have these poison spines, they're a prime walleye bait. So other cool. Mad Tom things? I, I just think they're really interesting. Yeah, they're really cool, miniature, little miniature catfish. Yeah. yeah. You're talking about the gar and how they can drown. When they drown, do they actually, do they wet drown or do they dry drown? Like, do they actually try to gulp air and then end up taking in water, do we know? No, I think they essentially suffocate because the interesting thing is even when, they, even when they're up at the surface taking in air, they're still using their gills because they intake air into the, um, the swim bladder and extract the oxygen. But to get rid of the carbon dioxide in their blood, they actually use their gills. So they don't come up to the surface and burp out, you know, bad air, so to speak, the way we would. They actually take in air, get the oxygen, develop, you know, carbon dioxide builds up from from metabolism and they excrete that through the gills. So even when they're not using the gills to get oxygen, they're still using their gills, you know, as, as part of respiration, but to get rid of wastes rather than, and they get some oxygen in the process. So they, they, they basically suffocate. They are trying to get air through the gills, you know, but under those higher temperatures where they need more and where there isn't as much available, they just can't get enough. And so they gradually suffocate. Other questions? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about sticklebacks? Sure. So Wisconsin has two native sticklebacks um, and one introduced stickleback. The native sticklebacks, uh, the most common by far inland is called the brook stickleback and it has five spines. So sticklebacks have a dorsal fin with, with separate independent spines. Unlike, you know, other fish may have spines but they're all connected by membranes. These are all independent. So a, a brook stickleback has five. It's a really, really common inhabitant of little small creeks and little sort of boggy ponds and things like that. And then the other na native species is the nine-spine stickleback, of course has nine spines, and that's a denizen of really deep water, deep cold water. So it's really common in the deep part of the Great Lakes, and then it occurs in a handful of um, deep inland lakes in the cold part of the lake. And then there's an introduced species that got in here about 30 years ago or so called the three spine stickleback, which is native to the East Coast. And um, that has three spines, of course. And it's become established in the, in the Great Lakes, isn't particularly common, hasn't caused you know, any known problems that we know of, but, but is common. But sticklebacks are all small. They don't get much bigger than this. They like to eat aquatic insects and other invertebrates. They're really interesting spawning behaviors. They build these sort of algae nests and the male goes through it and then the female goes through it and they have these sort of elaborate courtship displays and signaling by changing body color and stuff. So they've been, actually the three-spine stickleback's been subject of behavioral studies for years and, and a guy named Nino Turk Tinberg and won the Nobel Prize for, for science based on some of his studies of stickleback behavior a long time ago. Yeah. No, they don't occur in sharks. So the clonal forms that I'm aware of, I don't think, I don't, I'm not aware of any that occur in sharks. They're all of hybrid or, origin, so their original parents were two different species. And they, um, even, uh, and, you know, again, there's, I don't know, maybe 50 different fish combinations that have been, been identified. They tend to be small. They tend to live in somewhat extreme environments. 
But most of these other clonal forms that are out there, if you go look at them at any one spot, there'll be multiple clonial lineages. And if you go from Creek A to Creek B, there'll be different clones. So what's really unusual and unique about ours is it's based on one event. Most of these other clones are based on, you know, multiple events that seem to occur on a semi-regular basis. And again, they tend to be all female, and they have this pattern where the females reproduce clonally, parthenogenically, but they need a male, the original male of the, of the species that formed the hybrid, to kind of trigger the process, even though that male's genetic material doesn't normally get incorporated. So again, these are unusual in that sometimes the male, um, the male does get incorporated. And um, so this is, this is unusual even among these, these clonal forms. Uh, yeah, over here. Well, I think it's used as an electrical organ. It, it's like if you have you ever gone and, and tried to figure out if a light switch was working and you put in two little things and see if the meter moves. Maybe you've not done that, but it's a thing called a voltmeter, and we want to see if there's current, current in. And so, paddlefish, every living thing produces electric current. It, not very much. You're producing electric current right now, but it's really, really low, really hard to detect. And so the paddlefish has this paddle which is super, super sensitive to electrical currents. And so when it's swimming in the water, it can detect the electrical current that's put out by an organism, you know, that you can barely see. So it's really, really sensitive and it just swims around swinging this and it says, ooh, there's some current. And I can go and I grab what it is and then it swims around some more and ooh. And so it uses this to f to for feeding. It uses it to detect the electricity that's produced by other organisms and then find it to eat it. So it's that, that's what it's used for. You, Tim. Yeah, so John, all the fight netting is done in rivers. If you get a fight net, who eats? Have you had that dark? Yeah, well, it may, mainly it's from gill nets. Um, so we run a lot oh, of gill nets. Yeah. Anything where they can't get to the surface for, you know, and again, it depends on the water temperature and how, you know, how soon before you lift the net when they, they moved into it. But certainly if you set a net one afternoon and the fish went into it, you know, that evening, it's going to be dead by morning in, in warm water. And so if you're, if you're out this time of year and it's, you know, 40 degree water, the fish can sit in the net all night, it'd be fine because it's just breathing the air or breathing the getting us oxygen from the water. So this only happens when it's warm. And it only happens if they're <coughs> held under water for you know, at least an hour or two. So, and, but I've killed lots of them. I hate to say, I hate to admit. Yeah. <coughs> so sneakers and satellites grow up to be the big guys that uh, are the parental males. Are, I'm assuming that's true. No. They're locked in. I forgot to mention that. So early in life, they, they sort of, they don't decide consciously, but sort of biologically, a choice is made. And if you're going to be a sneaker, you're going to max out at this size, and you're probably going to have a short life. And if you're a satellite, you know, you max out somewhat larger and, you know, mature somewhat larger and somewhat older. And then if you're a, a parental, you're going to defer things till you're, you know, five, six years old and you're six, seven inches long. And so when they're first eggs, when they're first larvae, it's not fixed what they are. But at some point, we don't really know the process and there's an element of genetics, there's an element of the environment. So they, get, they get locked into something. And so it's, you know, if you have a whole bunch of, bunch of eggs coming in, a whole bunch of fry coming off a nest, it's hard to say, you know, who's who coming off it. <laughs> well, yeah, potentially, but it's a dangerous practice. <laughs> I mean, these little guys are very vulnerable, and the males, the males are used to beating up on each other anyway to, you know, from other parental males to guard their territory and assert their dominance. And so they, they literally weigh, you know, 500 times more than these little guys. And so they just, uh, one good headbutt, they can kill. And, and again, if you're a satellite, you're a little bigger, you're a little bit more immune to that, but you're still certainly susceptible. The male's going to be bigger and stronger. Or the, the parental male's going to be bigger and stronger. 
But no, as far as we can tell, they don't sort of start as one and then go to the other. They, at some point in their early life history, they lock into one strategy and, and they stay that way. But that, again, that's an area that's probably worth more research. It's, it's a hard thing to track. Yeah? Is it true that ducks kind of help spread species from different lakes to different lakes? That's one of those things I think that is hypothetically possible, but I think in reality it would be extremely rare. Okay. They would have to pick up a fertilized egg that was, and somehow get it to attach their foot and then fly somewhere without it, you know, without it falling off, and then it would go into the water. And typically, even, you know, most eggs never make it to adulthood, even under normal conditions, you know. 5%, 1% of the fertilized eggs actually make it to adulthood just from various types of mortality. And so in this case, you've added yet this whole nother layer of, you know, they've got to get first attached to the duck, then the duck has to fly somewhere where they don't dry out, then they have to land in the right place in the other lake, and then there's just one or two of them, and, and they have to actually survive and then find a mate. So, so you know, I won't say it's, it's impossible, but I think it, it's a, a thing people routinely say, well, they're never fishing here. The ducks must have brought them in. No, somebody with a bucket brought them in. <laughs> and so I think this would be extremely, extremely rare. Cool. Well, maybe we can have uh, one more round of applause for uh, John here. Thanks so much. <laughs>